morning, everyone. Let's stand and lift our voices together and praise God. We're grateful that you're here. And let's all lift our voices and sing to him. Thanks everybody for being here this morning as we gather to uh, take time to praise God. If you're visiting with us, we encourage you to fill out our visitor's card that's in the pew in front of you and put that in the offering plate. And also, if you have a prayer request, please write those down on the prayer cards and drop those in the offering plate in a moment. Let's take a moment now to greet one another and say hello to the neighbor that's next to you. Is done loving one another already? Did everybody get a chance to hug Sue? Somebody say amen. amen. What a glory to see her here this morning. What a blessing. Um, her surgery gone well. The recuperation has gone well. And she just continues praising God regardless. Uh, welcome this morning. Welcome to our visitors. 
Uh, at this time, we're going to continue praising the Lord with our tithes and offerings as our visitors come, as our ushers come forward. Excuse me. <laughs> Speaking of visitors, this is not yours to take care of. Our members are here to take care of these tithes. You guys are our visitors. If you choose to give, that's up to you, but it's up to our members to take care of the tithes to support our church at this time, so you feel free to do as God leads you. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we praise you and we thank you for every blessing that you bestow upon us. Father, in obedience to your word now, we take and we give a portion of that back to you. Father, the, the first fruits that we surrender back to you, we ask, Lord, that you take them, multiply them, and use them to further the name of Jesus Christ throughout this community and this world. In your name we pray. Amen. couple of announcements this morning. The Keenagers on Tuesday, August 13th, 8 o'clock at Browns. We have an upcoming women's retreat, September 19th, in Chincoteague, Virginia. Go ahead. Woohoo! Woo All right. Uh, if you want to be part of the women's retreat, you have a $50 deposit that's due yesterday. Uh, balance to be paid by the 1st of September. Uh, if anybody's interested, please see Joanne Carter. Joanne, you want to give them a woohoo? Woo There's Joanne. <laughs> children of God were in need of help uh, leading our children of God downstairs during their worship time. So if you're interested in that, please see Eric Shive or his phone number is in the bulletin. Next week, our children of God will be staying in the sanctuary with us. The sermon next week, the lesson will be about the Lord's table, and we thought it was appropriate for the kids to learn that and share that with us. There'll be a special lesson for them, and they're going to be staying with us throughout the service next week. Uh, sight and Sound, if anyone's interested in the Christmas program for Sight and Sound, please contact Dean or Barb Faree. Women's Prayer Meeting, Sunday the 11th, uh, and youth will be traveling on August the 16th and 17th, up for a camping trip with one of the churches that we've come together and share our youth group together with, Crossview Missional Bible Church. Uh, we'll be traveling up there camping on the 16th, 17th. The youth will get permission slips tonight for that. Uh, that will be our youth group. Anybody who's of youth age and anybody who is graduating from Awana into the youth is welcome to join us as well if they're interested. If anybody has questions on that, they can see myself or Karen, and we'll help you out. Who am I throwing it to this time to? Over to Jerry. Let us all rise, please. This morning, I'm going to read from uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, the third chapter, verses 14 through 16. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come and invade us now.
great are you, And all the earth will shout your praise Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing great and awesome and magnificent you are. We see your creation and the beauty that you've made, the harvest that's beginning to come in with all the crops. And God, we, we look out not just at nature and the fields, but, but we look out across the faces that are here this morning. And God, we see your greatness in making us to fellowship and share together as a body of believers. God, thank you for your greatness. And thank you too for your goodness, that out of your great goodness you give so much to us. And so, Lord, in return, we pour out all of our hearts and praise to you in thanksgiving today. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved Because you know just what 
unstoppable I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love love you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you God, thank you for the great love that you showed to us in sending your son. As your word tells us in probably the most famous verse in all of the Bible, that you so loved us that you gave your one and only son, that whoever believes will not perish, but have everlasting life. God, thank you that the expression of that love was through your son. Thank you that we have the promise of everlasting life with us. And thank you, God, that we know Regardless of the challenges and struggles and problems of this world, one day they will all be over. And so, Lord, that enables us to have peace in this life, peace for every day. And God, in that peace, help us to be a, a beacon of your love to those around us, that people can see you and us by the way we live our lives. God, we're not perfect. We're far from it. And as we contemplate your, your greatness and your goodness, we're reminded that we are all sinners. And we're all grateful today that Jesus Christ has died and shed his blood for our forgiveness. And so, Lord, we take a moment now quietly, each of us, to confess our sins to you. God's people said. Amen. Everybody can be seated. And before we dismiss the children, I want to talk just real quickly about something coming up in our church this week and ask our team from the Dominican Republic to come forward a while. Please come forward, team. This week, a team of folks will be headed down to Barona in Dominican Republic to do our annual uniform distribution. And so we want to take some time this morning to pray for that trip. But come on, come on, guys. Come on. Just come on. Don't be bashful. I'm killing time till you got up here. So we want you guys uh, as a church to be praying for these folks. They will be leaving Saturday and heading out, and they'll be putting over 200, school, 200 kids into school uh, this week, outfitting them with the uniforms and all of that. So that's a huge week for them, a lot of work, and it's hot down there. August, like here, is the hottest time of year in the Dominican, and if we think it was hot here last week, it's even hotter down there uh, in their prime time season with not only the heat but the humidity. So let's be lifting these up in prayer, and we're going to pray for them in a moment. But while the team is there next week, Sharon's going to have a real special privilege, and so we want to take a moment uh, for you to understand how we're building relationships with people in the community down there and how Sharon's built a relationship with this family and what it means. So, Sharon? And thank you to all of you. It's because of St. Peter's Church that 200 and probably close to 70 kids will be going to school again this school year. Thank you so much. 
On the picture, you can see a young man. His name is Jonesy, and he's our youth, and he's a youth and sports leader in Bate 9. He's been working with our kids that are sponsored kids for since we started putting them into school. I met him um, about two years ago was the first I met him. He now oversees our school uniform project in Bate 9. He coordinates everything to be ready when I'm there. He watches after the kids, the kids that have in trouble in school. He works with them. He um, does Bible studies with them. He, he feeds into these kids. He's a really important part of our program. In December, he and his wife had twin girls. And after the girls were born, Jonesy uh, messaged me and asked me if I would be the godmother for his girls. This is really huge. It's hard to get into the Haitian culture. It's, it's hard working with them because it's hard to, it was hard to get them to allow me to be there and do that because they don't trust you're going to stay. But actually to be brought into the circle of his family by being godmother to these two beautiful girls is really um, amazing. So he and his wife, Orpha, is standing in the picture. And you see Waslani and Waslena and their twins. And I still haven't figured out how to tell them apart yet. <laughs> so I call them sweeties. Um, so next Sunday, while we are in Bat, or while we're in the Dominican, we're going out to Bate Nine next Sunday morning. And while you guys are having church, they will be having church down there. Waslani and Waslena will be dedicated to the Lord. And so, you're my church family. So we just got two Haitian goddaughters in our church family. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I'm asking that you would all please consider that next Sunday morning while we're all down there, would you take some time to cover these girls in prayer and as, as a church family back here, dedicate them to the Lord and keep them covered in their years to come as they're growing up. They grow up in extremely difficult circumstances and surroundings and um, evil uh, challenges are all around them, if we could just keep them covered. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. So let's take a moment to, uh, to pray for our team and ask the Lord to bless them as they go. Hang on, Sharon. Hang on, Sharon. <laughs> Joanne, sorry. Go ahead. You know what you're doing? Go ahead. You know what I'm doing? That's fine. We're going to put the team down the middle. Everybody else come and put your hands on our team as we uh, commission them. I'm just excited, Paul. We can tell. Put the hands on her. Preferably not around her neck. <laughs> Mike would like to keep her for a little while longer. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the partnership that we have with uh, Pastor Albert and his church and the school in Bate 9. Lord, it has been a, a long-term relationship between St. Peter's and uh, the folks there. We've come to love them deeply. We've come to care about them much. We pray for them every day as we think of the students that we sponsor. And God, we're grateful for the opportunities that we have. We are such a blessed people here in Seven Valleys, Pennsylvania. And we want to share the blessings of what you've given to us uh, to people who don't have as much. So thank you, Lord, for putting these opportunities before us with these students. We know the way out of their poverty is through education. And Lord, getting educated and meeting you and building a new life together with you is their hope for their future, not just in this world, but in all eternity to come. So Lord, we pray you go with our team this week. Give them safety in their travels, fun and enjoyment with the students there. May they be pointing to Christ in all that they do this week and be your ambassadors to your children there. And Lord, we pray for uh, these twins, for Was Nili and Was Lania. We pray for both of them, God, that as they're dedicated to you, that they would seek to follow you their whole lives long. In Jesus' great name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now our children can go down to children of God time. Everybody else can return to your seats. And take out your Bibles with me and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We continue our year-long study through the book of 1 Corinthians. Now before we get to our text today, I want to ask everybody to bear with me this morning 
It's probably going to be a little bit long message. My wife read through my notes last week, and she said, you're going to be speaking for three hours. So I, I promise it won't be that long. Um, but here's why we're going to take a little bit longer probably than normal. This is a very difficult passage of Scripture to work through. Uh, its very nature has caused church splits. It's caused anger amongst people. It's caused distrust. It's caused arguing and the like. In fact, several times this week while I was studying, I said, Lord, why don't we just skip these 16 verses and move on to something a little more fun and light and a little easier to enjoy. But we can't do that, obviously, because this is part of God's word and, and all of it's there for us to learn from. So the message this morning in the text that we're going to look at is not hard because there's big theological words. There's not that at all. The reason that today's text is difficult is we don't understand exactly what was going on in the church in Corinth that prompted Paul to write these 16 verses. And so it's hard to understand precisely what it not only meant to them, but how it's applicable to us today, all these centuries later. So we'll talk more about that in a moment. Let's just read through the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 to 16. And as we read through it, it's going to be obvious what the issues are, and then we'll talk about them. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also shave her hair, cut, have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but the woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angel's However, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Judge for yourself, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. So let's take a moment to pray and ask the Lord to bring understanding and wisdom to all of us through this very difficult text. Father God, your word tells us that all scripture is inspired and is profitable and useful for us. And sometimes, Lord, we approach portions of scripture like this morning, and it's very difficult for us to see and understand the profit and the the means of it that's in there. We would just want to skip over it and say, well, that was for back then, and it doesn't apply to us today. But help us not to do that, Father, to see that there is something in these 16 verses that you have for us today. Give us wisdom and discernment as we work through it. And God, I pray for the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace for this church because we know that texts like this have caused massive division in churches around the world. And Lord, we don't want any scripture to ever come between us and be divisive to us. So give us, God, a spirit of unity and help us to look inside each one of us to see how we apply this to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. So based on the text that we just read, many would charge the Apostle Paul with 
being women haters, that he was opposed to women in general. Some would charge him with being a misogynist, a very popular word in our culture today. If you're not familiar with that word, a misogynist is one who hates, one who dislikes, who mistreats or mistrusts women. Others would charge Paul based on this text of being a chauvinist, which is someone who believes that men are superior uh, to women. And that's clearly not the case. That's clearly not the case because as we think through our Bible, when we think about how the Apostle Paul lived his life, our text started out today where Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, first of all, as Paul sought to imitate Christ, there was nobody in the world closer to women or loved women more than our Savior himself. Because outside of the apostles, the closest followers of Christ were women. Remember on Resurrection Day when Jesus rose again from the dead, the first to come to the tomb was a woman, Mary, and with her another band of women. Long before the disciples got there, the women were there uh, to to treat his, his buried body. Moreover, women supported Christ financially out of their own means, and we know that they loved him deeply, and he loved them back. And Paul was, in his life, seeking to imitate Christ. He was seeking to do exactly what Jesus had done. In fact, Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. For sure, Paul worked along men like Barnabas and Silas and Timothy and Titus as he planted churches and led them. But he also co-labored alongside a woman such as Priscilla, who not only ministered the gospel, but was a fellow tent maker with the Apostle Paul. There was Phoebe, who Paul put on a pedestal and said she was an outstanding servant of the Lord and of Christ. There was Tryphena and Tryphosa, who were commended by Paul as workers for the Lord, as well as to the church in Rome. And so at the outset, please accept the fact that Paul did not hate women. And this text is is not to be used for one to show that Paul was a woman hater. The apostle loved all men and all women, and he worked alongside of both sexes as he did his ministry. Warren Wearsby offers an excellent summary of this talking about the apostle Paul. He says, quote, The Christian faith brought freedom and hope to women, to children, and to slaves. It is taught that all people, regardless of race or sex, were equal before their creator, and that all believers were run in Jesus Christ. The local church, Wearsby says, was perhaps the only fellowship in the whole Roman Empire that welcomed all people, regardless of nationality, social status, sex, or economic position. And Paul promoted that unity under the headship of Christ. So let's put out of our minds this morning the idea that Paul was a male chauvinist or a misogynist. Hopefully I've demonstrated that that was not the case for him. So then we have to ask the question, okay, then what was Paul's purpose for this? And was that just for the first century in Corinth? Or is there some things in there that are applicable for us today? This gets to the issue as we study all of the Bible. Those are questions that we need to ask ourselves. When we read a particular passage, was that just for the people of that day? Or is it normative for us today? In other words, is it a a norm in society for Christians in 21st century America? This study of normativeness is is a personal passion of mine. It's something that I think is vitally important for us to understand as we look at the Bible through the right lens of the culture of the day in determining what's appropriate for us to apply to our lives today. So we're going to look at this text in light of normativeness today, saying to these laws that Paul set down here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, are they applicable? Were they applicable just to then or to people of all generations? Or were there some of the things in our text today that God did not mean for us to apply today? Discerning between what are permanent and universal and normative teachings of Scripture on one hand and on the other hand, that which is transient is critical for us. Let me look at two examples uh, to clarify this this morning. Deuteronomy 22 verse 8 says this, When you build a new house, 
You shall make a parapet for your roof so that you will not bring blood guilt on your house if anyone falls from it. How many of you have a parapet on your house? How many know what a parapet even is? Oh, okay. There's some here who know what a parapet is. A parapet is a wall that's on top of a flat roof. So think with me for a moment about that. If you have a house that has a flat roof, why would God tell you to, to put a parapet on it? Because, you, yeah, you don't want somebody to fall off and, and hurt themselves and, and be seriously injured or die. So when God gave this command to the Israelites, when they were going in to settle in the new land, the standard of the day was their houses all had flat roofs, right? That's the way in 1400 BC, when houses were built, everybody's house had a flat roof. Well, how many of us have houses with flat roofs today? Probably none of us, right? We all have houses that have a peaked roof. And so we don't have parapets on our roofs. Now, does that make us sinning every time we go home and we live in a house that doesn't have a parapet on it? Well, of course not. God's command here in Scripture was there to protect people, particularly young children, from wandering off the, the edge of the top of a roof. So we have to look at the lens of normativeness in making a determination. And one like this is sort of a silly example, right? Because from the context, it's obvious that, that we don't have to do that. Well, let's move on to a few more things that might be a little more difficult to determine. In Leviticus chapter 2, I won't read this whole passage, I'll just summarize for you briefly that when God had made all of the animals, there were some animals that God designated as unclean animals, and there were animals that were not to be consumed, including in that list was pigs or pork. And so when Israel was settling in the land, God prohibited them from consuming any pork at all. It was a forbidden animal. So, when you had bacon on your uh, egg sandwich this morning, were you sinning? Because this is a forbidden meat, right? Pork is forbidden according to Leviticus chapter 2. Well, the answer is, you, if you had bacon on your sandwich this morning, you were not sinning. Because according to Acts chapter 10, Peter had a vision from the Lord where God said that all animals are now made clean in Christ and you are free to eat pork. So whew, now we can have bacon and not worry about it, right? One of the four food groups, I think, is, is bacon, <laughs> at least for some of us. So we need to look at this scripture in light of normative, right? Are you starting to see the issue? Are you starting to get a handle on some things that are in scripture or just for a particular point in time, and others are more universal for us. So with that lens in mind now, let's come back to our text today. And I've chosen the title of today's message is Christian Order. Don't put that in the back of your mind. Keep that in the front of your mind, okay, as we go through this. Christian Order. What is God's design for there to be order in the home, in the church, in our communities, in our world? If you can keep that big picture idea in mind, it will really help you as we work through this text. So let's start back at verse 1. Paul says, be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions. Notice that word traditions. That's going to be an important one. Just as I delivered them to you. So here Paul gives us a directive. Number one, Jesus Christ is our example. We follow him. We live like him. We do what he did. Then Paul says... The apostles, the direct followers of Christ, those who lived with him, they saw him, they lived with him, they tried to live just like he did. Remember, they saw him praying all the time, and they said, Lord, teach us to pray, because they wanted to do what Jesus did. And then the third thing is Paul encourages us, do what they do. We don't have Jesus here. We can't see what Jesus did, but we do have the words of the apostles. We do have examples of how they lived their lives. We do have their letters that instructs us. And so Paul tells us that we're to imitate him as he imitates the way Christ lived. Now, before we move on, some of you may object to that. Well, that's, that's pretty high and mighty of Paul to say that. Do what I do? And just stop there for a second and ask yourself this important question. 
Are you willing to tell everybody you know to live like you do? Are you willing to say, go where I go, say the things I say, do the things I do? You know, when some of us were raising our kids, we would say, do what I say, not what I do. Well, that, that's not the principle here, right? The principle here is do what I do as well. And so this is probably one of the most humbling things that you can ever say. Do what I do. Say what I de- say. Imitate what I do. Gulp. Because we have children, grandchildren, right? And we know they're watching us. And sometimes they pick up on some of the things that we look at and we say, where did they learn that? And then we scratch our heads and we realize, oh yeah, I do that too. Paul encourages us here to be living examples of him. Christian order begins by being a living example, by being a testimony for Jesus Christ, by living like he did, by imitating Paul, by imitating the other apostles that are ultimately living just like Jesus Christ did. And so if we want to bring order to our world, it starts with us by following after the specific example of the apostles and Jesus Second way that we bring Christian order is by submitting to Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. So the key part to this passage here in verse 3 is that we submit ourselves to Jesus Christ. The word head here in verse 3 means the one who has authority over. And we submit to Jesus Christ because Philippians 2 says, at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow to those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we submit ourselves starting to him. We give all of our lives to him. We bow down in submission to him alone. But that's not all that verse 3 says. Paul says, I want you to understand, Christ is the head of every man. That's what we just talked about. The man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. What does that mean, that man is the head of every woman? And looking at it through our normative lens, does that apply to today? It may be a little vague, so let's go. One of the principles in Bible study is if you look at a passage and it's a little unclear, you try and find another passage in Scripture that deals with the same topic that may bring some more clarity to it. And so we're going to do that here. Ephesians chapter 5, I think, brings more clarity to Paul's intention. Paul writes, Wives, be subject to your own husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. There's the parallel, but notice it doesn't stop there. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, again, there's the idea that Paul's bringing out here in 1 Corinthians eleven three. so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so God's design for marriage is for husbands to lead, for husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And don't miss this, friends, because in context, the men have the biggest responsibility in the marriage relationship. This is huge. This is enormous. This is gigantic. How much does Christ love the church? The answer is that he sacrificed himself totally for us. So husbands, your job is to love your wife like Jesus did. Can you do that? Can you value her? Can you appreciate her? Can you give selflessly to her? Can you sacrifice for her? Now, in context, women have a responsibility, too. It's to be subject to their husbands. That should sound familiar. Be subject means to willingly, there's the key word, to willingly put yourself under. It means to give of yourself to another because of, be careful here, because of love. So wives, your responsibility to the Lord is to put yourself under the leadership of your husband because you love him. Now that sounds problematic, but follow me. If a husband loves his wife unconditionally, totally, and sacrificially, the wife is going to want to give herself to her husband in love because he's ultimately leading her in a way that makes her feel valued and cared for and appreciated. And can you follow God's design for order here and see its huge value? 
And again, this is not about women being less than men. We are all one in Christ. We are all of equal value to God and to each other. It's not about a husband making his wife a doormat. That's not an excuse for a husband to ever mistreat his wife. But it is God's design for order in the home. You know, chauvinism says that men should be out front. Feminism in our culture today said women should be out in front. But God's design, according to Genesis chapter 2, is that husbands and wives are right beside each other, right? Right beside each other. And that's how we live our lives as examples to our community. Paul goes on then in verses 4 and following to give a demonstration of the illustration of submission for us. Verse 4 says, Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. In Paul's day, when a man was going to teach or when he was going to pray, he would remove his head covering. Men wore what is called a, a tallit. And the tallit was over their head as a sign of respect. But when they would rise to pray, they would remove their head covering as a sign of their submission to the Lord. Now, if you're familiar with 21st century Orthodox Jewish customs, that may be, this may be a surprise to you. Because Jewish people today follow this exact opposite pattern. When Jacob and I traveled to Israel a couple of years ago, we, we flew on a flight where there are a lot of Orthodox Jewish men. And the Orthodox Jews will rise at specific times during the day for times of prayer. They will take their prayer book with them, and they will go and, and spend the time as required in prayer. But here's what the Orthodox Jewish men do today. They take their tallit that's on their shoulders, and before they start their prayers, they put them up on their heads. Now, that's the exact opposite of what Paul is saying here. And remember, I pointed out to you the importance of verse earlier where it talked about tradition, right? The tradition of Paul's day was that a man should remove his head covering. The tradition today in Jewish culture is to cover your head. In fact, when Jacob and I in Israel went to the wailing wall, we were not permitted to pray initially until we purchased one of these, a yarmulke and a kippah. And so before you approach the wailing wall in Jerusalem to pray, men are required to put the kippah on their head so you can go and pray. So you see the tradition, the culture, how in Corinth, Paul was telling them, men, remove your head covering. In 2019, when men pray, in a Jewish scenario, in a Jewish culture, we're to wear a head covering for us. So the traditions, the point here is the traditions are changing based on the time. Now, I want you to think back to our discussion today about normativeness. Paul says it's a disgrace to, to pray or to prophesy with your head covered for men. Indeed, men in our culture, if you wear a baseball cap when you come into church, what do you do? You take it off. That's our culture today. It's disrespectful to enter the church with a baseball cap on to pray and worship. That's our tradition. That's our culture today. So suggestion. This is a cultural issue for you. When we pray with our Jewish friends, and Jacob and I have a number of Jewish friends, we put our kippahs on, right? It's out of respect for them. It's out of respect for the Lord. It's out of respect for their tradition. Jacob even has a tallit. I don't have a tallit, but when he prays with his Jewish friends, he'll put his tallit up in, in prayer. And again, it's the symbol, the sign of submission of us being one under Christ. Now, verse 5. Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Paul says that women were praying and prophesying in the church. Now, this is huge. This is huge. Pay attention here carefully to me. This does not mean that women were not permitted to, to pray and to talk in church. That's going to be particularly important when we get to chapter 14. I don't want to get in that today because we already have way too much material for this morning. But keep this in mind. What Paul is saying is while women are praying and prophesying, they, need, they should have their head covered. So he's assuming that they are doing that practice. I'll fill in the rest of the details when we get to chapter 14. Now, note Paul is saying here that women should have a head covering on top of their heads when speaking in the church or when coming into the church. Does that mean now that all of you women 
should be going out to Lifeway this afternoon and ordering online a head covering. Warren Wearsby gives us some insight into the historical situation in Corinth that was going on that probably caused Paul to write this verse. He says this, quote, Corinthian women who appeared in the assembly without the head covering were actually putting themselves on a low level equivalent with temple prostitutes. The prostitutes wore their hair very short and they did not wear a head covering in public. Their hairstyle and their manner announced to others that I'm open for business. Does that make sense? And so again, now let's look at the tradition and the culture of the day, understanding what Paul is dealing with in writing to the Corinthians. He's saying that it's a disgrace for a woman to not have a head covering. Why? Because she's opening herself up to saying, my body is for sale. And particularly when going into the church, you would never want that, even for innocent women, to have that. Well, is that the case today, culturally, in our traditions today? If women don't have head coverings, does that mean that they're open for business? Well, of course not. Now, I want to be very, 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 very careful here today. And this, is, this has been uh, challenging for me as praying through this. So hear my heart in this. There are plenty of women that we know that do wear head coverings. We have some very good friends who she never leaves the home, whether, whether it's in their business, whether that's in their church, whether she's out in the community, and particularly in church on Sunday, she would never be seen in public without her head covering. She's a godly woman. She loves Jesus. And so the head covering for her is this symbol right here in the scripture. She's being obedient to it. Many in our church have Amish friends. And you know the Amish women always have, always, always, always have their head coverings on. In the Amish community, they hold to this verse as normative for today. Look back in your Bibles to chapter 10 from last week. This is, this is really important. If you don't catch anything else today, then, then hear this. Chapter 10, verse 31 says this. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Okay? So here's the thing, church. Those women that wear head coverings, what are they doing? It's for the glory of God, right? It's out of respect for his word. So please, church, let's not look down on any women who wear a head covering. They see that as a, a way for them to show their submission to the Lord. In the same way, ladies, if you believe in the head covering is normative for today, Please don't look down on other women who have their freedom in Christ, who look at this and see that was a culture issue for them back in Corinth and is not applicable for us today. Does that make sense? Verse 10. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. This is really confusing. It's really confusing to me, and I'm, and I'm not sure I still have it 100% clear, but I'm going to give you my best shot and understanding this. Because of the angels, it is hard to understand. And Bible scholars have proposed lots of different uh, solutions to what Paul meant here. But I'm going to give you, again, the best interpretation that I can find. Holy angels, which are unfallen angels, continually maintain their submission to the Lord. Satan and other angels that rebelled against God are one day going to be judged for their rebellion against the Lord. But holy angels remain in submission and service to the Lord. They willingly submit themselves continually to do the Lord's direction. The angels show their submission to God continually by being devoted to him and not rebelling against him as Satan and other angels did and became fallen angels and demons. Therefore, God is giving us through Paul's instruction here some direction about because of the angels. The wearing of a head covering is a decision and an indication of the willingness to submit to the Lord just as angels do. So again, this verse comes back to the culture in Corinth that it was a disgrace for a woman not to have her head uncovered. And we want to live in such a way that the angels, who scripture tells us are here this morning and worshiping right along with us as we're worshiping. Isn't that cool, by the way? We want to do all that we do for honor and glory in submission under the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Paul moves on then in verse 11 to talk about the interdependence of men and women. He says, however, in the Lord, neither is a woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Paul here asserts for us that men and women need each other. Remember back to the creation account. And what did God say after he created Adam? He said, it's not good for the man to be alone, and I will make a helper suitable for him. God created Adam for Eve and Eve for Adam to be mutually dependent upon each other in the Lord. And these two verses, Paul is showing that interdependence of how much we need each other. The very real sentiment that Paul was getting at here is that husbands need wives and wives need husbands. Guys, can I get an amen out there? I know I need my wife. And then in verse 13 and 14 and 15, if we didn't, haven't had enough controversy today, let's stir up one more. Paul talks about the length of men's hair, and does that matter? Judge for yourself, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. The custom in Paul's day and most generations is that a man with long hair brings dishonor to himself. Probably this has to do with the conventions that long hair on a man would blur the gender distinctions. And since gender roles do matter, unlike what our culture today says, gender roles do matter, Paul is showing in Scripture that men pretending to be women and women to pretending to be man is not God's design and not God's way. So again, keep these chapters and these verses and these texts in mind when we deal with our freedoms in Christ. Does that, man, does that mean that if a man has longer hair than is typically normal for a man, does that mean that he's a disgrace? Well, of course not. Again, the culture and tradition today is different, but what Paul was getting at here is the issue is the gender confusion that was being created out of that. Well, I've already talked for too long, so let's bring this home and some points of application for us. First, God has designed worship to be respectful and orderly before the Lord. So as you prepare to come on Sunday, ask yourself this question. Am I prepared by my attitude, by my dress, by my demeanor to give respect to, to the Lord and to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Come in such a fashion every Sunday that you're prepared to worship him. Number two, are you living your life so that you're an example to others? Remember what Paul said in verse one back at the beginning of our text, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And can you say that to the people that are around you, to your family and your home, to your brothers and sisters here in our church, to those in our community, to those who work with you? Are you willing to say, do what I do? Number three, our church doesn't insist upon women wearing head coverings, however, Frequently, we have women here who do wear a head covering. And please, 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 folks, please respect their interpretation of that. They're honoring Christ and doing what they do. On the other side, for those who believe that women should wear head coverings, please understand the freedoms that we have in Christ. That's been Paul's major emphasis in chapter 8, 9, 10, and now in the first part of chapter 11. We are free in Christ, and some of the traditions that we held to once aren't necessarily as applicable today. So many, myself included, believe that our text today was to deal with the specific issue in Corinth that no longer is going on today. We are free in Christ to, to make that determination. If we wear a head covering, that's great. It's as an honor to the Lord, but it's not obligatory, I believe, for all women of all time. Just as Christ submitted himself to the will of the Father, so also we submit ourselves to him and to his leading. Christian order leads us daily to submit our wants and our desires to Jesus Christ. And so here's my closing, closing thought. Are you totally sold out to Jesus Christ? Are you living for him in every day and every way? Is he your priority? Is he both your Lord and your Savior? For a lot of people, he is their Savior. They believe in him that he's paid their sins, but is he your Lord too? Are you totally submitting yourself to him and to his leading? 
If you've not believed in Jesus Christ before today, I would urge you to do that. He loves you. He cares for you. He values you. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. So if you've not believed in Jesus Christ, during our prayer time this morning, I encourage you to come forward. Brother Jerry and Brother Mark will be here to, to pray with you and give you the opportunity to, to confess your sins and to believe in Jesus Christ today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the grace to get through this very difficult text this morning. This was hard for me in preparation. This was hard for me uh, this morning and leading up to, to bringing forth this message which you've given to us right out of the scripture. And so, God, I, I pray that what was lacking inside of me, Holy Spirit, that you fill up in the hearers of this message. God, help us to take the portions of this that are applicable to us and see its value and worth. God, help us to refrain from being judgmental toward those who may view our liberties in Christ differently. For those women who see the submission to Jesus and the priority of wearing a head covering, God, we may, may we, like them, give honor and glory to you through wearing that head covering. And Lord, for the majority of our ladies who don't wear a head covering, then God, we, we celebrate that Christ is has made us free and that we're not under the law. We're under Christ in our submission to him. And God, let this not be a divisive issue in this church or any other church, whether how long our hair is or whether we do or don't wear a hair covering. We have way, way more meaningful things to engage in in our church and our culture than getting caught up on, on some of these minor points in Scripture. God, help us in our obedience to follow you. Lord, may we, like Paul says, follow me, imitate me, do what I do. Whether that's with our children, whether that's with our grandchildren, whether that's with the children that we have here in the church, whether that's with our fellow believers that sit in the pews with us. God, help us to be that example of Jesus Christ in everything that we do. And Father, now we uh, lift up our time of intercession as Brother Mark comes to lift up those prayers now. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. <clears throat> we just ask that you would uh, be with our, these prayers that we bring before you. We ask that you be with Joanne for strength. Let's continue to guide and direct her. We ask that you be with Randy uh, for his current medical conditions, uh, whatever that may be. Lord, I just pray and I ask that you would uh, fill his mind and his spirit with you, Lord. We ask that you would be with Wanda. She uh, was diagnosed with stage three chronic kidney disease. So we just ask that you would continue to be with her and the doctors as they go forth with this, Lord. We ask that you be with Tom Smeltzer. who's uh, moved to rehab. Just pray for continued healing, uh, his neck surgery. Be with Stan Smeltzer, who's going to be having surgery um, to remove some more skin cancer. Father, we're just praying, we ask that you be with these folks, just encourage them, allow us as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage them as well, and to be there for them and support them, Lord, as they go through this journey. Father God, we just uh, ask continued prayer for Batay 9. We just continue to pray for the children down there with this whole uh, school project, and uh, just... Uh, as we prayed earlier for the team that's going down there, we just want to continue to uplift them uh, for safety and for health and uh, that God will continue to shine through them, Lord, that they can continue to touch and change lives there in the bidet. Father, as we leave here this morning, we just pray that you be with all of us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit being here. Father, we ask that we, when we leave this building, Lord, that we are filled with you then we can take that film and that light and just allow it to shine throughout the community. That we can be a beacon for you, Lord, in all that we do and all that we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand with New Hope now and let's uh, sing our closing worship. If you are in need of prayer, I invite you to come forward uh, to be prayed for.
song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Holy, there is no one like you There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are and fear above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one
Father, may we always keep that in the forefronts of our mind, that it is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that we need to look to for our example. Father, I pray that we would just worship and glorify you each and every day of our lives and that people can see Jesus through us. I pray that we would not be judgmental of others, Father, that we would focus on our relationship with you. Father, we just praise you. We thank you and we love you. We thank you for your word, Lord, that you have given us to live by. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you all for coming and have a blessed day.